Okay, that worked. Thank you very much. I'll just hang on till we start. Hi, Supervisor Keel. We can hear you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hi, good morning. This is a sound check. AT&T moderator, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very clear. Are you able right. to understand me in return? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you. Spanish inter interpreter, is, this is a sound check. Can you hear me? Hi, good morning. This is a Spanish interpreter. Good morning. Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you.
Hi, good morning. Supervisor Mitchell, can you hear me? Supervisor Mitchell, can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the special budget hearing meeting of the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Today's Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. Our meeting today is being held remotely due to the current public health crisis to protect the health of all. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Mitchell. Good morning, present. Thank you. Supervisor Kuehl. Good morning, present. Supervisor Hahn. Supervisor Barger. I'm here. Fizia Davenport, Chief Executive Officer. Present. Rodrigo Castro Silva, County Council. Here. Celia Zavala, Executive Officer of the Board. Here. And I'm going to call Supervisor Hahn again, but I understand we may be having some issues with connectivity. But she, we're working on that. Supervisor Hahn? Okay. All right, then. Uh, today, we'll begin with the report by the Chief Executive Officer, and then we'll hear from uh, board members, followed by departmental speakers, and then we will take up public comment. Supervisor Hahn, you're present. Hello? I see her name, but okay. Maybe she's having trouble with communication. Okay. All right. Uh, item number one is a report, as you know, by the chief executive officer. And item number two is public hearing. These items are related and therefore will be taken up together. So let us begin by hearing from our chief executive officer, Bezia Davenport. Good morning, madam. Yes. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, Honorable Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present today during today's public hearing. Um, as you already know, the budgets are iterative processes, and the county's budget is no different. By way of a reminder, on April 20th, I presented to you the recommended budget, which the board adopted on that date, and the recommended budget was posted online on the county's website. Today is designed to allow the board to receive public input on that recommended budget that was posted online last month. <clears throat> no budget decisions will be made today or any other actions taken on the budget. Those items will be reserved for the next phase of our budget cycle. The next phase of our budget process occurs on June 28, 2021, where the board will have the opportunity to deliberate before taking action to adopt the final budget. After the final budget is adopted in June, the third and final part of the budget phase will occur on October 4th, 2021, when my office will submit additional recommendations for what we call the supplemental changes budget. I have prepared a short presentation uh, for the board to remind us where we left off during the recommended budget in April. And I'd also like to provide some updates regarding the governor's May revised budget and then provide information about continued pressures on the county's budget. But before I begin, I'd like to underscore that this budget seeks to advance the priorities of this board of supervisors and our shared values as a county. It's a spending blueprint for both our aspirations and our extensive public service responsibilities. At the end of the day, this budget is designed to be committed to the county's core safety net mission, responsive to those needs created by the pandemic and the inequities it exposed, and poised to pivot to address emerging needs, whatever they may be. Ordinarily, the chief executive officer would appear before you at this public hearing to briefly discuss the county's budget and then lay out some of the challenges and funding obligations ahead. 
but this is no ordinary year. So my presentation will be framed somewhat differently than what we've done in the past. There is a PowerPoint presentation that has been provided. It is posted on the county's website as well. And I understand that it is also publicly displayed uh, for members of the public who may be signing on to the website. And if we could move to slide two. Thank you. <clears throat> Embracing opportunity for a transformative change. I think we have all heard it said over the last 15 months or so that we are in historic times and that we are at a point of inflection. It is the fact of these historic times that sets the groundwork for transformative change. The $36.2 billion recommended budget adopted by your board last month provides the starting point for this work as we look to supplement our budget with additional revenues from the state and federal funding. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about our reasons for optimism. Beyond the positive trends we are seeing on the public health front, we are also getting positive information on the economic front. We are seeing our revenues increase and we are hopeful that our revenues will continue to rebound to pre-COVID levels. We are anticipating $1.9 billion from Washington in the American Rescue Plan funding, as well as potential additional funding for the American Jobs Plan, which is now being negotiated in Congress. On the horizons of the American Jobs Plan in Washington, we hope that that will be signed into law and send millions of dollars our way. We see a state budget with a large surplus and the potential outlined by the governor to bring an unprecedented $12 billion to address the homelessness crisis and other urgent needs statewide. All of that adds to a growing sense of optimism about what LA County will be able to accomplish, not just in the near term, but to set a foundation for the years ahead. We are positioned like never before to comprehensively address so many of our longstanding barriers that have held back individuals and communities for generations. Things like institutional racism, barriers to housing and jobs, the digital divide, environmental equities, and of course, justice system reform. My goal is for the county to come out of this pandemic better than before. My description of how we get there is budgeting for change. And key components of budgeting for change depend on additional revenues that we hope to receive uh, from the state and federal governments. Next slide, please. Let's talk a little bit about uh, advancing uh, key board priorities and initiatives. As a reminder, our county budget process is guided by the priorities established by your board. These include advancing racial equity, justice system reform, supporting those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, investing in affordable housing, and continuing our work to combat homelessness. As I reported in April, we've established the Alternatives to Incarceration Office, as well as the Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Office. There is also a recommendation in the recommended budget to maintain our investment in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. These are just a few examples of the recommendations that are contained in the budget that seek to advance key board priorities and initiatives. I'll take the next slide, please. This board has adopted a transformative care first jails last initiatives and measure J is a cornerstone of that initiative. I'd like to take some time to unpack the information in the slide. As you know, we will begin the three year phase in of Measure J with a $100 million down payment beginning on July 1st, 2021. This is the single largest allocation in our entire budget for a new program. This amount was included in our recommended budget and approved by your board as a starting point from which we will grow to achieve the full set aside by June 30th, 2024. The CEO team understands the importance of this work and it takes and takes it seriously. 
In between working on the budget and the CARES Act dollars and now the funding that we'll be receiving from the American Rescue Plan, we have been hard at work on Measure J. We appreciate the hopes and dreams of so many that have devoted their time and energy to move the CARE First Jails Last model forward, and we are committed to doing our part. And while I cannot commit at this time that additional funding will be identified for the down payment, we have two additional budget phases to go through, which is June final changes budget and October the supplemental changes budget. And so while I'm unable to make that commitment today, I can commit to this board that we are doing everything we possibly can to identify additional funding while balancing other priorities of the board. We will provide the board updates on our efforts during final changes and supplemental. I'd like to talk a little bit about the Measure J methodology. So on March 16th, 2021, my office issued a memo to your board providing notice that we would propose in the recommended budget $100 million as a year one down payment of the Measure J set aside as we build up to the full set aside amount by June 2024. As we previously stated, the $100 million proposed allocation represents the single largest allocation for a new program in the recommended budget. In that March 16th memo, we also provided our best estimated projection of the full amount of the set aside, $300 million, based on the current data. We call it a projection because we're using data from fiscal year 2021 budget figures to project what the figure might ultimately be in fiscal year 23-24. We call it an estimate because our work to refine all of the numbers is ongoing. A very important question has arisen as to whether the 10% set aside amount is based on the total amount of locally generated revenue. Essentially, simply take 10% off the top of our locally generated revenue figure or off the top of our net county cost figure. At the heart of this question is this notion of unrestricted, the language that's included in the Measure J ordinance. On May 17th of 2021, I issued another memo addressing the questions around restricted versus unrestricted. Based on our office's experience with developing the county budget for many years and the knowledge obtained over those years, those combined tell us that calculating the Measure J set aside requires more than taking 10% off the top. The ordinance requires something different. The Measure J ordinance requires a set aside of 10% of the locally generated unrestricted revenue net county costs. Locally generated unrestricted revenue is a new budgeting term for the county, and I cannot overstate the significance of inserting the word unrestricted into the phrase locally generated revenue. State law prescribes how counties are to prepare their budgets and requires that they are balanced when the budget is adopted. Like all budgets, the county's budget includes a revenue component and it's balanced with the cost component. And if the cost and the revenue don't equal each other, the budget is not balanced. You see, locally generated revenue is a well-known term in county budgeting. The board has discretion over this revenue, which includes sources like property taxes. The term locally generated revenue has an established meaning and has been used in county budgeting for over 20 years, maybe even longer. We use locally generated revenue to pay those county costs for which there is no other funding source. These costs are called net county costs. On the issue of net county costs, the term net county costs has been in use in the county for many years. It's not defined by law, but it is defined in the glossary of the county's annual budget books. Some of these costs are required often as a result of a federal or state law, legal settlements, contractual obligations, a maintenance of effort requirement, debt service payments, or board budgetary policies and regulations. 
Because there are no other revenue sources from which to pay these costs, the county must use locally generated revenues to cover them. Because locally generated revenue must be used to pay net county costs, the two are, for all practical purposes, two sides of the same coin and are inextricably linked. At the end of the day, locally generated revenue must be used to pay net county costs to balance our budget. Because some of those costs are required, then the revenue used to pay them are restricted. Another major factor that supports the methodology for the Measure J set aside calculation is the new term coined in the ordinance, locally generated unrestricted revenue. If each word in the ordinance is to be given effect, and if no word is left redundant or irrelevant, then the insertion of the word unrestricted into the phrase locally generated generated revenue changes its meaning. The addition of the word unrestricted acknowledges that a portion of the revenue must be restricted. Otherwise, there would be no reason to add the word and coin this new phrase. Finally, the last major factor that supports the methodology is the legislative intent of this board evidenced last summer when the Measure J ordinance was being deliberated over the course of three board sessions. It is clear from those discussions that the calculation for Measure J would involve more than taking 10% off the top of locally generated revenues or net county cost figures. In fact, those discussions never contemplated simply taking 10% off the top of the locally generated revenue figure. More specifically, there was no discussion during those uh, deliberation periods where the board discussed a $900 million figure. The discussions were always around a figure about in the area of about $360 million. And that was a back of the envelope figure that was suggested by the prior CEO without doing the detailed analysis that's required by Measure J. Even though there is not universal agreement on the methodology, we know that the work must continue. The Measure J Advisory Committee is hard at work on proposals for how to spend this funding. This is an intensive and important part of the process. So far, my team has presented to the Measure J Advisory Panel four times but we know that this is a complex topic and more engagement is, is needed. Yesterday, I had the privilege of meeting with several leaders of the Measure J Advisory Committee. I shared with them my understanding of the need to do this work and express my appreciation for the work that they are doing and answer questions that they had regarding our interpretation of Measure J and the methodology. We will continue to go back and finish the conversation. I also shared that my office is working with the board on a series of equity focused investments for the American Rescue Plan funding. Some of those proposed investments intersect closely with the investment categories for Measure J, although they are not necessarily identical to them. Our aim is to leverage all available resources to support the board's vision and build a county that is better than before for all of our communities. No one initiative can do it alone, so we must think bigger. And it is my hope that we can present your board with a package of funding proposals to advance this work and invest in our communities on a scale we have never seen before using Measure J dollars, as well as other funding streams that are coming the county's way. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, Department of Youth Development. Another hallmark of the Care First Jails Last Initiative is moving away from a prosecutorial and legalistic approach to dealing with our justice-involved youth and toward a youth-centered approach focused on diversion and development. The CEO's office is very supportive of this approach and believes that it is an idea whose time has come. 
Therefore, we are working to achieve this goal on two separate but parallel tracks. Your board has asked my office to develop recommendations and an implementation plan for those recommendations that can be, an that can be implemented without legislative changes. In essence, start with what we can do sooner rather than later. And we are committed to that work and we have a report back that will be coming back to your board in a couple of weeks. We are also looking at those things that will take a little longer to accomplish, including addressing existing legislative barriers, labor relations issues, and identifying ongoing and sustainable funding sources. Next slide, please. So a couple of decision points ahead for your consideration. This year, more than ever, we have significant decision points and changes in the budget ahead. In early June, we will be presenting to your board a recommended spending plan for the American Rescue Plan investments that I mentioned a moment ago. The proposed investment areas will generally fall into four broad categories. One, maintain the public health response against the pandemic. Two, continue to support economic recovery of our region. Three, support equity investments that will make the county better than before. And four, sustainability and preparedness. As mentioned previously, we'll return on June 28th for the final adopted budget phase. This will incorporate more up-to-date information on revenues and also is expected to reflect the impact of the state's budget on the county's budget. Lastly, we expect to return with the Measure J year one programming allocations developed with the input from the advisory committee. And then we will close the budget cycle with the supplemental changes budget on October 5th. Next slide, please. So I'd like to quickly acknowledge the fiscal discipline that your board has demonstrated and explain why that has been so important in enabling us both to meet our safety net responsibilities and to fund your BOAT policy agenda. Your leadership and foresight have enabled us to avoid the boom and bust cycles that other local governments have experienced and to keep our workforce strong stable and able to rise to any demands that may come our way. We've certainly seen that in the past year and we are grateful that your leadership has put us in such a strong position to weather the storm and to continue to serve our constituents as demands for services rose sharply during the pandemic. Next slide, please. A leader baseline. Because of that discipline that I mentioned earlier, we are coming into this new fiscal year with a new leaner baseline. The cuts that your board approved in the current year, that's the 2021 budget, those cuts have provided us with the ability to fund the boat policy agenda we are taking now. In fact, those cuts made the year one Measure J allocation of $100 million possible without layoffs or curtailments. I will note that this may not necessarily be true in future budget cycles as we ramp up funding to meet the full Measure J set aside by June of 2024, but the leaner baseline established in this fiscal year positioned us well to be able to move forward with the Measure J first year set aside starting next year. Next slide, please. So a couple of challenges on the horizon. Uh, despite our overall optimism, we do have challenges on the horizon. Even with a $36.2 billion budget, we cannot meet every need and we must bear that in mind as we meet some of the challenges and emerging issues. One example, as you see on the slide, is the loss of the Title IV E waiver and the Families First Transitions Act funding this October. That will result in a $260 million deficit in the DCFS budget. For fiscal year 21-22, we have identified some funding solutions as we 
were aware that this funding model would be changing, but we also must work to identify a permanent funding solution for fiscal years 22, 23, and beyond. Next, we know on the horizon, we are closely monitoring the impact of the LA Alliance homelessness lawsuit. Um, although that uh, work is underway, we are closely monitoring and hope hopefully positioning ourselves to be able to prepare uh, for any outcome out of that lawsuit. And then I'd like to talk a little bit, there's a bullet on the slide that talks about legacy and technology systems. And here's an example that I think really brings it home for, for all of us here in uh, the county. Previously, I discussed locally generated revenues and the main source of our locally generated revenue is property taxes. The secure tax roll system, which is used by our treasurer and tax collector and our office of auditor controller is over 40 years old and is in need of replacement. So we will be working with auditor controller and the treasurer and tax collector to identify funding for a new computer system that brings us into the 21st century and that ensures that we can continue to collect and our property taxes in an efficient and effective manner. Every budget has pressures and our budget is no different, but these are just a few examples of the scale and the magnitude of what we are dealing with in terms of pressures on the county's budget. Next, please. Challenges on the horizon. Finally, there is pressure from more than $40.2 billion in unfunded liabilities, including retiree health benefits. Just by way of background, state law requires us to provide employee benefits that go, that extend beyond the time that an employee works for the county. That requires that we pre-fund these benefits ahead of time, or we use a pay-as-you-go approach. Unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, there was not enough funding set aside for these benefits in the past, and it has resulted in an unfunded liability for us today. The county has taken steps to address these unfunded liabilities, which requires additional funding over the long term. Moving to the last slide. Next slide, please. Notwithstanding the challenges I just outlined, I'd like to close by taking note of the incredible opportunities we have before us. The board has shown time and time again your commitment to embracing big opportunities, facing up to tough challenges, and expect us to actually solve problems and not just manage them. Through your clear priorities, forward-looking vision, and the additional state and federal funding coming our way, we are now in a position to build upon a foundation for a once in a generation shift in investments. Thank you for the opportunity to present today and I will be happy to take any questions you may have or listen to your comments. Thank you very much, uh, our Chief Executive Officer Fizio Davenport. I really appreciate the presentation and I hope it does help to clarify uh, many, many issues that I know we've heard from our constituents. Uh, members, I just want to remind you that um, we will have an opportunity to ask questions and we'll go in order, numerical order. And as chair and the first district, then I will, I will begin my uh, statements and then I will go to Supervisor uh, Ollie Mitchell, Supervisor Kuehl, Supervisor Hahn, and Supervisor Barger. And at that point, then we will open it up for uh, department heads, and then we'll we'll also hear from the public. So, uh, with that, please uh, please bear in mind. I'm going to try to go through this quickly, if if I can. First of all, I want to uh, reiter reiterate my thanks to our our new CEO, Fizio Davenport. This is your first budget, and I want to thank you and your team for your continued hard work on this. Um, today's meeting, as you know, is an opportunity for us to hear from the public on their response to the budget recommendations provided to us by you on April the 20th. This last year, as you know, has impacted so many of our residents, particularly the Latinx and African American communities, as well as our low income families and children. And this upcoming budget, in my belief, is an opportunity to address pre existing 
systemic issues that were further exacerbated by the pandemic. Obviously, there's always uh, a need to do more, uh, and we know that that's the, the current circumstance. But I would say to you colleagues that there is much more to be hopeful about as our economy and our budget continues on the upswing. Uh, now is the moment to address issues head on, and that's my belief. As of May 14th, over 9 million vaccine doses have been administered across the country, as many of you know, with at least 60.8% of county residents age 16 and over having received at least one shot. And over 46.7% of residents 16 and older we know are fully vaccinated. And with more people getting vaccinated, we are at that closer point uh, that we can hopefully get out of this pandemic. But we need more people to be vaccinated as we as we know, because there are some communities, many that I represent, that still have very low vaccination rates, such as areas in the unincorporated area of Pomona with the 14.4% rate, and in areas that I represent in the city of Los Angeles, 32.2% for Westlake and 37.5% in South Park. So we need to look at how to make the vaccines more accessible to working residents, to essential workers, workers as well as people who are homebound, as well as reaching our children ages 12 to 15 years of age who are now eligible to be vaccinated. We also need to urgently push out more community outreach and encourage people who are still hesitant about the vaccination. And we need to debunk any misinformation and myths that are out there. That's why I've always advocated for programs like the Promotoris, which hires local residents from our community to provide outreach and education to their community. People want to receive information from trusted sources in their preferred language and culture, and the Promotoris, in my opinion, serve as a trustworthy source that helps to bridge that public service to our community. COVID really forced us to reckon with the inequities experienced by so many people in our communities, especially communities of color. That includes the inequities in the level of health care, lack of, of affordable housing, and access to resources and opportunities. And I believe that we must approach uh, this as a resource allocation within an equity lens, meaning that we should strive for justice and fairness. And we have, uh, as you know, for decades talked about equity, but it's it's not just a buzzword any, anymore. We really have to make it a real action. And in this case, put funding uh, resources behind it. So when we make funding decisions and allocate these resources, those decisions, in my opinion, must be based on data. And it can't be necessarily always divided by five. That includes funding that is on the way from the federal government, thank goodness, and the state. And I want to give a special shout out to President Joe Biden and Governor Gavin Newsom for taking such bold action to send the stimulus funding to our local governments to provide direct relief to our residents. And now, with that funding on the way, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to ensure that every resident in California comes roaring back, especially in those most underserved and disadvantaged communities that have been historically left behind. As you know, just last week, the governor released his fiscal 21-22 May revised budget, which includes $454 million in funding for a full cleanup of a now shuttered Exide lead battery recycling plant as well as to accelerate the cleanup of homes surrounding that facility. I relentlessly advocated for, along with some of the board members here, and testified multiple times in Sacramento for funding to deliver environmental justice to these communities who have endured pollution, contamination for decades. And now we are one step closer to that reality. When we think about strengthening our communities, we must also talk about investments in our young people, our youth. Last year, I championed, along with this board, to restore the cuts to the Youth at Work program, which provides long-term career pathways in high-growth, in-demand industries. And although some ongoing funding was identified for the program, the majority of it remains funded on a year-to-year -year basis. We really need to commit to this program in our youth by dedicating ongoing funding, and we need more programs like this one. We also can't lose sight of addressing homelessness. 
which still remains the county's most pressing moral issue. We need to consider every option to building more housing that supports people experiencing homelessness, as well as affordable housing, including the exploration of some of our own county properties. This includes looking at the restorative care villages for each of the county's hospital campuses to provide that continuum of care for our people who have mental health and physical health needs. Again, care first, jail last. One example of using county-owned land that deserves highlighting, in my belief, is the Care First Village. First in the nation, mental health and well-being campus consisting of 232 units of interim housing made from modular trailers and shipping containers repurposed into a home-like space that was built on a vacant county parcel. The total cost of the project, as you may recall, was $59 million, of which $6 million came from my own discretionary funding to help cover the gap. The most remarkable feat of this amazing project is that it was done in record time, six months. This is now a model for others of how to build more housing in a quick and cost-effective manner. There are so many residents who before the pandemic were barely getting by and the economic impact of the pandemic has left them hanging on by a mere thread. That's why we put into place the eviction moratorium and other initiatives to ensure these residents don't fall into homelessness. And then last year with the Federal CARES Act funding, we all advocated to support funds for some of our most vulnerable residents. 145 million for food aid for families and seniors, 110 million for rental assistance, 180 million for small business grants, and 20 million for childcare. And again, we're going to continue to advocate for much more in the upcoming 1.9 billion stimulus package through the American Rescue Plan because we know people are still struggling. And we're also working to demolish the Men's Central Jail and replaced it with systems of care throughout the county and our communities. The new system of care guided by the county's Care First Jail's last approach will help provide criti critical wraparound social services to those who need it and can be diverted away from incarceration. And we need to stop criminalizing poverty and mental illness. Rather, we need to help our residents heal. I believe that that's our duty. And for those who ask why the county should pay for these services, I would ask, who do you think is paying for our jails, our camps and halls right now? It is you, the taxpayers. We have so much work ahead of us, but I wanted to highlight some of the priorities that I and I know some of the board members and our residents can expect to be in the budget process as we consider formally adopting a budget in June. With that said, I want to ask our CEO, Fizia Davenport, a few questions. Fizia, are you still on the line? Yes, I'm here, Supervisor. Thank you so much again for your presentation. And I wanted uh, to discuss the Youth Development Department. I understand that some people have expressed their disappointment that either no department will be stood up by July 1st or that no money was included in this recommended budget. Can you briefly explain where we are in terms of moving forward on this very important initiative. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you for the opportunity to, to clarify. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by underscoring my strong support and commitment and my office's support for this board priority, a priority to transform our approach to justice for our young people. And just as a reminder, um, your board in November of 2020 directed a five-year timeline to establish the new department, recognizing that it would take some time to resolve some of the complex budgetary and legislative issues that are involved. We'll be reporting back to your board in the next several weeks with our analysis. I expect our report to address some of the things that will take longer to accomplish, like legislative changes and labor issues, and the need to identify ongoing and sustainable funding sources. But we will also include some more immediate options for advancing this very important work in the near term. As for funding in the recommended budget, we did not make an initial funding recommendation because our report to your board is still in progress. And normally what happens is we issue a report with recommendations and then the board 
if the, the recommendations are acceptable to the board, then the board adopts those recommendations that will include an implementation plan. So we do plan to return later in the budget cycle and ask for your approval of funding for things that we can accomplish immediately while the longer range efforts continue. It's an urgent priority and that's why we are working on both tracks to make the new department a reality. We intend to fully realize your board's care first jails last vision, not just for adults, but also for young people and their families. Thank you. I have, an, I have uh, just two more questions. One is um, you discuss funding streams that are headed our way, the state funding as well as the Federal American Rescue Plan. Can you please explain if any of these funding streams are subject to the Measure J set aside? And if not, can you please clarify? Yes, um, thank, thank you for that question, Supervisor. We've been getting that question a lot. Um, the funding that's coming from the federal government under the American Rescue Plan is not locally generated revenue. And we know that Measure J is specific to locally generated revenue. So the answer is that the ARP funding under the American Rescue Plan is not subject to the set aside. However, we believe that there are some powerful synergies with these federal dollars. When we, become, when we come before your board with our recommended allocations for the American Rescue Plan next month, we hope to be recommending a series of equity investments that to support the very community and the types of programs that Measure J aims to address. We also think there'll be significant opportunities to le leverage the state dollars to undertake programming complementary to Measure J as well. And so we're very encouraged to see uh, the governor's may revise proposals that my office is currently analyzing. And so at the end of the day, supervisor, when our office looks at it, even if the ARP funding is not subject to the Measure J set aside calculation, that doesn't prevent us from deploying and, and preventing your board actually from deploying those dollars in a way that invest in the same types of areas that Measure J and frankly that the Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative is focused on jobs, housing, access to resources and training and things of that nature. Great. And just lastly, uh, Ms. Davenport, I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned that uh, the county is budgeting from a leaner baseline. Uh, can you please explain to the public what that means? Because my sense is that people may not fully understand some of the, um, how could I say, uh, measures, safety measures we took, precautionary measures to help stabilize our budget during the pandemic. And we fortunately did not have to lay off people. So can you explain what the leaner baseline means? Yes, thank you, Supervisor, for the opportunity to clarify. So you may recall um, during the 2021 budget cycle, when we were preparing for that budget, uh, that was early during the COVID uh, pandemic and our revenues were crashing and we were facing a very uncertain economic landscape. And so based on the recommendation of the CEO, your board approved 8% cuts to departments that are funded with locally generated revenues. These were deep cuts totally nearly $370 million and led to the elimination of more than 2,500 vacant positions. The biggest single department that received an impact of those cuts was the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department's budget was reduced by $145 million and approximately 1,392 positions were eliminated. There were also about 500 positions that were eliminated from the probation uh, budget during the same round of cutbacks. So those cuts were tough, but because we made them, we were able to reduce the budget amount, the budget level that we are starting from today. And that played a significant factor in allowing us to set aside the first $100 million for Measure J without doing layoffs in fiscal year 21-22. So to say it another way, we reduced our budget baseline 
we had less costs. <clears throat> and therefore, when our revenues started to come back online, we were able to set aside that first 100 million for Measure J. And as we look to uh, future budget cycles, I can't commit uh, that we will follow this same path and this same trajectory, but it was able to occur this year as we recommend the fiscal year 21-22 budget. And so at the end of the day, I thank the board for its foresight and discipline in approving that leaner baseline because it did give us a stronger foundation uh, to start with our fiscal year 21-22 investment, including Measure J. Right. Thank you so much, Thesia uh, Davenport, for your presentation and responding to my questions. And I want to again commend uh, you and your staff and also this board, because what you've outlined here, I believe, have been priorities of the board. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, now in order, I will uh, turn to Supervisor Holly Mitchell for her comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. This has been very helpful this morning. And so I want to join with you in thanking our Chief Executive Officer and um, her budget team for all the work that goes into developing a budget. Uh, having spent 10 years serving on the budget subcommittee or chair of Senate budget, I certainly understand really the uh, often unseen um, work that goes into developing budget bills and all of the background work that is necessary to prepare both the elected body, you know, and the general public um, to be able to engage in a really important public discourse um, about investment. So I want to lend my support. And I appreciate the presentation and hearing her reasons for optimism. I fully agree as well as laying out clearly the challenges on the horizon, challenges like, you know, the unfunded liabilities, you know, also known as employee benefits. The county is both a service provider and an employer to over 100,000. So that was very helpful to see that number and understand it, as well as the infrastructure um, investments. And I thank you for the specific examples you gave us because it reminded me that oftentimes in lean budget years, whether your government or your own household budget, it's those uh, infrastructure investments we always tend to punt uh, when you're broke, if you will. Uh, and the county has huge you know, numbers of buildings as well as computer systems that we cannot you know, continue to ignore. They're critical to our ability to actually collect revenue in the example that she gave. So I appreciate seeing and understanding the challenges presented. I also appreciate uh, the, our CEO's continued work with regard to the Measure J Commission and your very clear um, explanation today with regard to methodology. I know that work will continue and I appreciate your ongoing commitment to working collaboratively with our key stakeholders. Um, you know, semantics, uh, words are powerful and understanding um, um, how different methodologies have been arrived at is really important. Uh, again, this is my first opportunity as a newly elected supervisor to engage in the county's budget process. And so I really am looking forward um, to this full experience. Um, I have always believed and operated in accordance with the notion that, you know, budgets are value statements that we pay for or we fund what's important to us or what's important for us. And that will be the lens I will continue to use now as a member of the Board of Supervisors. This new budget for the next fiscal year offers a really unique opportunity to make choices that will operationalize or will manifest equity in our county and support those residents who've been impacted the most by this pandemic, by, by the economic um, challenges this pandemic brought to bear, by historic inequities that far too many residents of this county have had to live through and experience. As Madam Chair stated, the upcoming 
American Rescue Plan and Measure J funding allocations are not only consequential moments in our county's history, but are have consequential uh, relevance to our overall spending plan. Um, and again, it creates a unique opportunity for us to, again, develop budgets that are value based. I look forward to hearing um, the public comment, which is the primary focus of today's hearing. Uh, I think it's an important element of what we do as policymakers to create space and an opportunity for community stakeholders and the general public to understand the process to fully understand the complexities of building a budget for a county of this size that is both an employer and a service deliverer. Uh, and I look forward to my own learning curve uh, as I um, try to bring forward um, the priorities that the constituents who live in the second district demand of me and demand of all of us. Uh, I will reserve um, questions I have as we continue through the process but really today look forward to hearing what the public has to say and sharing their perspective as we enter our budget deliberation. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Mitchell. Next, I uh, will recognize Supervisor Sheila Kuehl. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. My uh, deepest thanks to our CEO, Fizia Davenport and her team. I don't know that people who have not followed the county over the last several decades really understand how fortunate we have been or how well we have chosen uh, in bringing first Sachi Hamai and then Fizia Davenport into this role. Because uh, while we will uh, often propose and uh, even set an agenda and a vision, it is really the CEO's office that is called upon to dispose to make a thing real. As um, our colleague, Supervisor Mitchell said, a budget is a statement of values. And I have to say, I don't believe I have ever seen for such a large jurisdiction, the kinds of values expressed in this budget and how they are virtually totally focused on those among us who need the help the most. We have learned so much during the pandemic about the, the role, the responsibility, the duties of government. In many ways, governments have ended up being sort of the last man standing and have been called upon to do everything in their power with far fewer resources to try to keep people from falling further. Uh, in the areas of health, in the areas of housing, and in the areas of propping people up when they were not able to work. Um, those are the values of this board. And I think that this budget uh, in this particular moment expresses those. It is indeed a transformational budget with an eye and a lens on racial equity, on sy systemic reform. Uh, on those who are uh, affected by the pandemic and affordable housing, on homelessness, on um, our young people. And though there will be many fears and hopes expressed by those who have come here to testify, I want to reiterate my commitment. And as I see it across all of our offices, our commitment to what is essentially um, the, uh, the three-legged stool of survival, health, housing, and work. Uh, and that also includes criminal justice reform because that has been a barrier to health, housing, and work in our communities, especially our communities of color and poorest communities. As the CEO indicated, the Measure J allocation envisioned in this budget is a floor, not a ceiling. Uh, we have benefited over the years by looking beyond the obvious and finding what we can to make something happen. We have to build not only pouring money into services, but we have to build capacity. We have to help with preparation 
to accept capacity. We have to look upstream and upstream and upstream. How are we dealing with our youngest children? How are we helping families with those children? How are we keeping young people from falling into the justice system? How are we treating them when they do, which is a grand idea about moving, dealing with youthful offenders away from a law enforcement approach. And that is something that we will do, as the CEO indicated. So my deepest thanks uh, for working to make all of these dreams come true. Um, the addition of the money from the federal government, uh, the ARP money, hopefully the jobs and infrastructure money, which includes child care and the caring services, and the money from the state will help us to augment, as our CEO indicated, those um, equity investments envisioned in Measure J, but before Measure J. I mean, I want to remind people, it was this board that put Measure J on the ballot. Um, that's how it got there. You probably could have gotten the signatures, but not over such a short time. So we're committed to and want everyone to understand that we understand what it is we put on the ballot. Um, so I see this as a great opportunity for us to hear and listen more um, and mm, refine when we come to final changes at the end of June, refine when we come to supplemental changes on, in the beginning of October, which we always do. And we're committed to more, more, more and real transformational change. Thank you very much. I have no questions to the CEO. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh, next, I'll recognize Supervisor Janice Hahn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and again, I, I will join the chorus of uh, uh, praise and thanks to uh, Fizia Davenport for her presentation this morning. Uh, and just to say that, you know, you really are the, the kind of CEO that understands our priorities, understands the fiscal uh, responsibility that we have in governing a county of this size. And it's not just once a year that, that we uh, engage in conversations with you about the budget. It's weekly um, that we have discussions with you about our priorities, uh, about serving our constituents, about strengthening the safety net uh, that the county is. And we thank you for that. And welcome to Supervisor Mitchell, uh, we all were uh, pleased when you were coming our way because of your experience uh, at the state level with the Senate uh, budget process. So we will uh, look to you uh, for your insights and your perspectives as we make our way through this year's budget uh, process. I am looking at the clock and I realize that we're already an hour into a public hearing and we haven't heard from the public yet. Uh, so I, I will try to, to keep my uh, remarks brief and, and say uh, I agree this is a, a statement of our values. Uh, we are going to figure out how to fund our priorities and our values through this budget. Uh, I thank you for laying out the challenges that we have in the future, although I'm one of those that's a little bit skeptical of the uh, projection that if we end up having to house uh, more of those who are on our streets, whether it be Skid Row or under the uh, overpasses and underpasses, that it will actually cost us $500 million and result in 2,000 uh, layoffs. I'm just one of those that doesn't necessarily believe that. I also think the, the public will probably not be thrilled uh, that we're spending 400, exceeding $450 million over the next uh, five years to figure out how to collect their taxes uh, more efficiently uh, and effectively. They, they would probably rather that money uh, go somewhere else. I, I will say that you answered it, Fizia, in your opening comments, but I know I'd asked about it. Uh, the first time we talked about the budget was whether or not uh, we could increase that down payment uh, for Measure, Measure J, if we could try to find another $50 million um, to, to make us even further along towards the ultimate $300 million uh, commitment that we've made, because I just really believe this down payment is so important in beginning 
that hard work uh, of diverting uh, people in their lives from uh, ending up in our justice system and being a more productive part of our society. We know it costs us $60,000 a year uh, to incarcerate an adult. And more shockingly, it's costing us about 526000 a year to, to uh, incarcerate a young person. So it's clear just by those numbers that investment will definitely pay off, uh, not just in uh, you know, human benefits and social benefits and mental health benefits, but fiscally, it makes a lot more sense to us uh, to keep people from uh, being incarcerated in our jails. It costs a lot of money. So I'm hoping that you could, in the next two bites of this apple, uh, Fesia, I would love it if you could still really try to make that down payment even more, even though it is the largest uh, as you said, uh, amount of money that we've ever allocated uh, to anything of this sort it is the right thing to do. And as, as Supervisor Kuehl said, this board put this on the ballot. This board is behind Measure J. We really believe uh, that it'll make a difference. But I think the more investment in the beginning will pay off tremendously on the back end. And the last thing I'll say is... Um, you know, they're calling me Miss Telework, uh, but I do feel like the pandemic uh, forced us to really take another look at, um, uh, you know, what it means for people to not uh, show up to work in a county building, but in fact, uh, spend time working closer to home in their own home and hoping that as we move forward in this budget, uh, we'll find ways to get out of some of these leases that we have in buildings that we don't own uh, and spend that money more on investing in the kind of infrastructure and network that I think uh, county employees would appreciate uh, to uh, work uh, again from their own home or close to home. And I'm, I'm looking forward to some of these uh, telework type opportunities that again, I think that will save the county money in the long time. Uh, improve work productivity and morale. And I, and I know, Fiza, that you know that, and, and I know you're looking for those opportunities. I'm not going to ask you any questions now. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to listening to the public, see what they have to say about uh, this budget. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Supervisor Catherine Barger. Thank you, and, I, and I'll, I'll be brief as well, because I know that the public uh, hearing component is important for us all to hear um, from people that are going to be calling in. But I want to thank you, Fizia, and your amazing team, as well as all of our budget team up here on the eighth floor that represent the board. Um, you know, this budget, it doesn't happen overnight, um, and I really appreciate all the work that's been put into it. Um, you know, our situation continues to evolve with the reopening of the economy. And I know that we are being cautious as we move forward, but we are reminded that our budget is critically important. And we've seen that firsthand this last year in terms of um, the role that public health has played throughout this pandemic. There's been demands for services and programs to provide for food, for housing, for public safety, for healthcare, mental health, and quality of life, um, which remains strong. Um, it is, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to ensure that the county has the fiscal resolve to continue to provide these essential services for years to come. The decisions that we make now will have a significant impact on the lives of each of our 10 million residents. And I'd like to thank my colleagues and members of the public who will participate in today's budget hearing, because this truly is a live document. And I think that, that um, as we move forward, into June, um, we have opportunities to look at um, at how this document is going to really frame um, the future and years out. Um, I'm interested in the public testimony, and I want to thank those who are going to be calling in. But Fizi, I just want to clarify, and I think Supervisor Solis asked a question, but given that Measure J relies on existing revenues, um, because it does not generate revenues, it, it's obviously you explained how the formula came out to play. How are we ensuring that our workforce is protected, given the federal funds sustaining us through the pandemic are one-time funds that expire in three years? And I point out that you talked about the 2,586 positions that were eliminated. Those did not have anyone occupying those positions. 
So departments are lean right now with the 8% cut that was made last year. I just want to understand if we are planning moving forward in order to ensure that we are sustaining those critical positions that actually um, are occupied now. Yes, thank you for that, Supervisor. And thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Um, as you correctly pointed out, Measure J does not generate additional revenue. And essentially, what it requires us to do is to look within our county's um, general fund to figure out how we're going to um, allocate the Measure J, um, the full Measure J allocation, the full set aside by June of 2024. The hope is that over time, as our uh, revenues uh, come back online and come back to pre-COVID levels, that we will be able to basically use those, those increased revenues to help support and add to the Measure J set aside. That would be the ideal situation. But if the ideal situation didn't occur, then I believe that there is an opportunity for us to look at uh, some of the ARP revenue. Uh, one of the things that the American Rescue Plan allows local jurisdictions to do is to backfill lost revenue. It is a very complicated formula. I believe the formula is about 10 pages in the Treasury guidance of how do you how do you calculate lost revenue. But we are also we also know that that may present an opportunity if there is a need to do additional curtailments that might provide an opportunity for us to backfill lost revenue to either mitigate or avoid the need to do curtailments. Once that one-time funding goes away, uh, which is in uh, December of 2024, uh, that's, a, that's a, a far time out from today, but we would really need to, to get creative and we would really need to plan um, you know, in the buildup to the Measure J, uh, looking at both increased revenues, our ability to use ARP, and then what happens afterwards. And so it's gonna take quite amount of, I think, um, monitoring, discipline, and strategic planning to ensure that we don't end up uh, having to do additional curtailments and layoffs. And uh, and I agree with you, Supervisor, that the departments are lean right now because of the, the positions, the, those vacant positions and those cuts that we had to do in the current year. Thank you. And then just one last question, because I, I wasn't going to ask this, but, but when you talked about the challenges on the horizon and you talked about the unfunded liabilities um, and the pay as you go, I thought that we actually had set up a trust account to bring down that liability amount, which actually I think resulted in a bump in our bond credit rating. Um, are we still setting aside money in that account to bring down our liability? Yes, we are, Supervisor. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, members of the board. And at this time, then we will uh, entertain uh, requests to speak from some of our uh, county department heads. So at this time, we'll hear from county department heads who've requested to address the board. And we'll begin with Sheriff Bill and Weva, and then uh, Assessor Jerry Prang. They both requested to speak. And uh, Sheriff Bill and Weva, you have three minutes. So please begin. Well, three minutes to discuss a three and a half billion dollar budget is kind of tough, but I'll do my best. I can tell you this that right now I'm looking at your justice system reform is actually a defunding effort of, of uh, the sheriff's department. And it's been doing by section as since I've taken office. We suffered a loss of 145 million in the current fiscal year. This new proposed budget for the next fiscal year is a cut of another 143 million to our net county costs. And we're seeing the trial court funding adjustment of 15 million is taken away. Public safety sales tax, 114 million taken away, and the the voting waters grant of a million taken away. So that's 143 million that's taken away from our current operating budget. And the problems, the existential threats that the county is facing in terms of homelessness is not going away by defunding law enforcement. Crime 
is not going away by defunding law enforcement. In fact, I have a 95% increase in homicide, 10% increase in rape, a 15% increase in aggravated assault, a 45% increase in grand theft auto, 18% increase in arson. So what your scheme is doing is by defunding us and discrediting our operations, you're degrading the capacity of the sheriff's department to prevent crime, to investigate crime, and detain those who commit crime and hold them accountable. That is not making life any easier. And these are existential threats, rising crime throughout the county. Homelessness, the encroachment of the encampments as it interfaces with the community everywhere is becoming an existential threat to the community. The fires generated by these homeless encampments is an existential threat to the community. Illegal grows in the high desert, existential threat. Dispensaries, the, the illegal ones outnumber the legal ones 50 to one in the basin. None of that is mentioned by anyone here. And uh, I applaud the, the money that you're throwing at, at the homeless situation. However, until you decide to regulate and reclaim public space, you're wasting your time and your money because every year, I guarantee you, you'll have home, more homeless than the year before. So your uh, 232 unit uh, village there, uh, Supervisor Solis, at the cost of $59 million, we can applaud you, but another 2,000 years at that pace, you might get a, your handle around the homeless situation. It is unrealistic and you're damaging public safety and we're gonna take very aggressive efforts to start working on the situation with rising crime, with illegal grows, uh, dispensaries, and also how the homelessness is impacting the entire county of LA. That's my responsibility, my obligation. I will send you the bill. Uh, next, we'll hear from Assessor Jeffrey Prang. Uh, Assessor, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Honorable Chair, Supervisors. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, visit with you today to present my uh, budget work plan for the, for the coming year. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking your board and the CEO for your ongoing support of our efforts to meet the core operational needs of my office and for our objective in making the property tax administrative system more efficient and equitable, all while continuing to provide high quality of public service. While COVID-19 did present many challenges, we have been able to adapt and manage in this difficult environment. Indeed, given the outstanding commitment of the staff of the Office of the Assessor, I am pleased to report that we are on target for completing our assessment role production on time. Last week, I transmitted the annual assessment role forecast estimate to the CEO and to your board, which in includes the, uh, the completion of the SoFi Stadium, which is valued at approximately three and a half billion dollars. Uh, we currently estimate that the uh, value of all accessible property in the county will grow at approximately three and three quarters percent, which is quite exceptional given the uh, impact on the economy over this past year. While the, the growth is down from the 5.97% growth that, uh, in, from 2020, it still reflects positive and reasonably optimistic growth. Uh, but please keep in mind that this number is a snapshot as our, to our production as of today, and it is subject to change as we continue our production prior to the June 30th roll closure. Factors contributing to this year's lower um, forecast estimate is due to a significant degree, um, a reduction in the cost of living adjustment permitted under uh, Prop 13, the maximum is 2%. This year, the Board of Equalization uh, determined it would only be 1%. Business personal property growth uh, showed a modest reduction, and while new construction did see an increase, roughly half the, it's roughly half the typical growth that we've experienced in recent years. However, transfers of property, that is the buying and selling, um, are still going strong and are contributing to the growth of the assessment role. Uh, the residential market was very strong with a median sales price of a single family home growing over 15% in the last 12 months to an all time high of $775,000. Additionally, uh, my office was uh, successful in restoring about $650 million to the assessment role, uh, primarily from the restoration of those properties that lost value in the last recession. Um, but uh, in spite of the anticipated gain of this component, we are expecting a significant increase in both de decline in value applications and assessment appeals um, uh, in the coming year. My office has uh, undertaking a comprehensive and proactive approach to assist property owners who were negatively impacted by COVID-19. 
uh, based on factors such as property use, type, and purchase date. We have identified parcels that are most likely to have experienced a decline in taxable value for the 2021 assessment rule. We'll be reaching out to those property owners to determine whether an assessment reduction is warranted. Qualifying properties will receive an adjusted annual tax bill prior to the first installment of the uh, uh, property tax bill uh, when it's due. All property owners, regardless of our proactive um, outreach, can still file a decline in application with our office beginning July 2nd. Um, and even though the proactive outreach is atypical in normal years, we expect that that's statistically insignificant and only a marginal impact uh, um, on the assessment role from those reductions. Um, among my major initiatives for the, for the coming year um, concerns the efficiency with the, the assessment appeals process. As you may recall, LA County receives about twice as many appeal applications as all the other counties in California. We've been making steady progress in recent years to overcome a significant caseload and backlog. However, COVID-19 compelled most counties, including ours, to suspend um, appeal hearings at the beginning of COVID. As a result, the number of appeals has increased from just over 20,000 in March of last year to more than 40,000 uh, currently. We anticipate that number to grow dramatically as property owners file decline in value applications and appeals. Thank you. I, I need to uh, let you know that your time has expired, Assessor. We really do appreciate your comments. And if you want to submit anything uh, for the record, we're happy to also include that. So um, with that, if you could just quickly in 10 seconds, please wrap up. Um, I don't think I can wrap it up in 10 minutes, so I'll just say thank you at this point um, for your time and attention. I appreciate you. your, your uh, discussion and, and comments, and we'll, we will all take that uh, on, on the record. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Members, uh, now we are going to go to uh, public comments. And as indicated on the posted agenda, we'll be taking telephonic public comments during today's meeting. The executive office of the board received over 300 written public comments for today's meeting. And as those written comments were received, all of them were available to the supervisors for their consideration, consistent with the Brown Act's requirements. We'll continue to accept written public comments throughout the meeting, which will also become part of the official record. We will now begin to take public comments on both agenda items and we'll offer two minutes for each speaker to allow everyone who's called in to offer input on the budget. Madam Executive Officer, please read the call-in information that was also provided on the agenda and explain the speaking rules to those members of the public who are calling in to address the board. As indicated on the agenda, members of the public wishing to offer public comment should call 877-226 8163 and use participant code number 1336503. For repeat, please call 877 226 8163 and use participant code number 1336503. Do not call that number if you only want to listen to the meeting. To listen only, please call 877 873 8017 and follow the instructions. Each person will have two minutes to speak on both agenda items. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. If you're not speaking on topic, if we cannot tell if you're speaking on the agenda item, you will get one warning from county council or the chair. If you do not immediately or clearly get on topic, or if you stray off topic again, you will forfeit the rest of your time and the chair will move to the next speaker. Please note that if you're also listening to the board meeting on a computer or speaker phone, you will need to turn down the volume on those devices as soon as the moderator calls on you. If you do not turn down the volume, there will be an echo. Moderator, may we have the first speaker, please? As a reminder to address the board, if you have not already done so, please press one then zero at this time. Do not press one and zero a second time or you will be removed from the queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Supervisoras, como recordatorio para dirigirse a las supervisoras, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione 1 y luego 0 en este momento. No presione 1 y 0 por segunda vez o será eliminado de la fila. Gracias. Thank you. May we have the first speaker, please? Our first participant is Michael Green. Please state which agenda items you're addressing today. You may begin. Yes, 
Sean uh, Michael Green, our regional director for SEIU for LA County. Uh, I'm addressing the budget uh, hearings today in both items. And I'd like to start with last month, dozens of SEIU members shared with you their stories about how they and their coworkers stepped up at a great personal sacrifice to meet the challenges of COVID-19 pandemic. Today, you will hear from a few more, including our public health nurses who work with great urgency to provide COVID testing, contract tracing, and vaccines despite extreme staffing shortages. Our social workers who navigated the challenges of maintaining client trust while following social distancing guidelines. Our community workers who assisted families whose members had turned into dangerous and harmful drugs to cope with COVID. Our ER nurses separated from loved ones by a job which required them to sleep in hotel rooms for months. And our medical case workers who are always there to address the psychological traumas of COVID patients and their families. SEIU members are everyday heroes in the truest sense of the word. We are confident that you will show them recognition, appreciation, and compensation that they so clearly deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cynthia Megadeleno. Please state which agenda item you'll address today. You may begin. Uh, budget hearing. Please begin. Budget hearing. This is Cin good morning, this um, supervisors. My name is Cindy Magdaleno. I'm a medical caseworker in the clinical social work department at All of You Medical Center. You've heard from many speakers today about the enormous emotional and psychological toll exacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The job of my department was to help our patients and their friends and families with the support and compassion they needed to cope with the impact of COVID and to decompress the hospital by facilitating the transfer of recovering patients to supportive safe recovery facilities. At one point, 110 of our hospital's 200 beds were filled with COVID patients. Our team worked diligently to place recovering patients in homes, hotels, short-term shelters, and other recuperative care facilities so we can maintain capacity to care for patients with acute care needs. In the middle of all this, my family and I contracted COVID-19. While I was quarantined, I kept working via teleconferencing, decompressing the hospital, and placing recovering patients. My work was essential, and I pressed on no matter what. Thank you for letting me tell my story. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Geetha Amaruthas Karan. You may begin. Hi, um, my name is Geetha Amadasadhan. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm a social worker at DCFS, and I, I urge you to support Hero Stay for All. Everybody's life was turned upside down because of the pandemic, but the expectations of our jobs as social workers did not go down. We had to get the job done no matter the cost to us. That, mean, that meant tons of travel, not just from home to office, but throughout the field. And it also meant finding creative ways to do our jobs. I must remind you and remind all of us that our clients are people. They were afraid of the virus too. They also feared exposure. In-person visits could potentially be deadly. Social workers had to be resourceful and imaginative to build client trust. We did our duty and we still do. We overcame the challenge and connected people to services they needed. We did this even though there, were, there was not always access to protective equipment during a deadly pandemic. So we ask that you honor our work. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And our next participant is Marquita Harris. You may begin. Hi, good morning. I'm addressing the budget items. Good morning, my name is Marquita Harris. I'm a public health nurse in the Department of Children and Family Services representing SEIU 721311. DCH is the leader in the pandemic. The nurses have sacrificed a lot. Nurses deal with community dangers, drive-by shooting and drug activity. We are the second largest group of nurses in LA County. DC developed health orders, contact tracing, COVID testing, lab processing, vaccine administration for all populations. DPH nurses continue to care for all the population with extreme staffing shortage, limited and or no PPE until August 2020. We have watched our peers die. 
I was afraid of dying as well and infected my family, and some of them actually died. There were more than 262 COVID-related deaths with healthcare workers and first responders. Skilled nurse facility staff have died at 43%, and nurses continue to be more than 29% of the COVID deaths. DPH nurses are mandated to work overtime, mandated to work in offices, health facilities, skilled nurses, their long-term care, homes, community access into the communities with LA County. But we stepped up and we took care and we brought everything to help you get out of the pandemic. But it's not over. Health facility and child work nurses have been extremely short since at least 2016. DCF children have died on LA County's watch, Gabriel Fernandez and Anthony Avalos. Nurses all should always be at the top of the budget every year because we are the nurses, we save lives and we are the safety net for the community. Nurses deserve hero pay and cost of living every year. We should not have to beg for leftover budget crumbs. We should protect, you should protect us, respect us and pay us. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Lawrence Reyes. You may begin. Uh, yes, good morning, um, supervisors. Um, I am a constituent of Hilda Solis. My name is Lawrence Reyes. I'm a senior community health worker at the Department of Mental Health and a proud member of SEIU Bargain Unit 711. I want to remind everyone what my mother would say, de algo malo sale algo bueno. I'd like to acknowledge and receive the optimistic forecast from the CEO this morning. My mom be the internal optimist would always remind me that out of every challenge comes opportunity. I have worked the streets going on 14 years with the chronically unhoused, the severely mentally challenged, and the disenfranchised. The truth is social distancing created a massive problem in my line of work. People need human connection to develop truly human relations. That connection helps us gain trust and consistency with a person whose life is fragile and lacking human connection. However, social distancing increases the feeling of isolation and despair. For people who are suffering, especially those turning to drugs and alcohol to cope, treating them becomes a persistent human endeavor. As an example, I got a call from a family in East Los Angeles whose son had turned to meth to cope. While using, he was shot three times, ending up in a county hospital for two months. For him to have another opportunity to recover it was just as critical to treat his intertwined substance abuse and mental health challenges as it, was, as it was to treat his gunshot wounds. During COVID, we had to rely on virtual visits, not the same as in person. We asked for heroes pay. We made it work. My client made it through. This is what we mean when we say that we are the safety net of LA County. And this is uh, my story. Uh, thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bruce Banares. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. I'm addressing the budget item. My name is Bruce Banares. I'm a registered nurse in the emergency department at LAC USC Medical Center. I am for Heroes Pay for All from the COVID Relief Federal Money. Over a year ago, I moved away from home due to COVID. I lived for four months in downtown hotels. I was not able to see my other half or loved ones. I was isolated in a hotel full of medical personnel. I had to drive through the National Guard during BLM riots downtown. I lived through the riots. I moved back a different person. For several months, my partner and I have been in couples therapy. We are trying to reconnect. We are opening communication. We are working on intimacy. No matter what was going on in my personal life and my personal needs, I came in and suited up to care for patients during the pandemic. I lost a part of me in this pandemic. I have been personally affected by being an ER RN at LAC USC. Other, others around me have been affected too. It's over a year since I started working in the ER during the pandemic. I can't find one thing interesting on TV or the internet or social media. I'm uninterested and have no interest, no passion. I'm going through the motions. I'm sad and depressed. I've cried on my way to work, and at work, I've cried this week too. As much as I'm high on life, I've hit a low, a low that has me fighting tears daily. Some label it post-traumatic stress, 
others' emotions. Whatever it is, I'm going through it. I thought I'd share because I don't think I'm alone. Now that there's a reprieve from the intensity, the stress, the never-ending people, the ER, in emergent situations, COVID, I'm no longer in the thick of it. My mind, my body is starting to process what I've been through this last year. I cried when I wrote this. So much emotion processing. Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Bart Diener. You may begin. Good morning, supervisors. SEIU 721 appreciates how difficult it can be to prioritize expenditures, manage risk, and balance competing demands. We know that as we emerge from the pandemic, the needs of LA County residents are great while resources to meet them are not unlimited. We support many of your board's initiatives, including investments identified in Measure J. But the county must not take on new obligations at the expense of its workers. We are confident this was not your board's intention when it put Measure J on the ballot. A cost of living increase for those who held the county together throughout the pandemic should be a given. Without a cost of living increase, inflation, which spiked in April at an annual rate of over 13 percent, threatens to reduce the value of paychecks workers depend on to support their families. The American Rescue Plan explicitly recognizes the importance of compensating essential workers to show real appreciation for what they have done and what they do every day. Adopt a budget that does not take your workers for granted. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Genevieve Claveral. You may begin. Hello. Yes, so good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, thank you for allowing me time to speak on the budget. I'm a little bit concerned about uh, some of the numbers. Uh, even so, I am pretty much in agreement that maybe some of the positions need to be removed. Like you have 2,586 positions from different departments. In the last few months, because of COVID, it's very obvious many of the county employees have decided that they don't have to work so much and i'm sure pretty much will not want to come back a full time in person to the county so i hope that you look carefully about that those items because especially uh, the county employee uh, taking care of the commissions many of the commission i mean is a uh, Many things are not kept up to up to date, and so on. So, and uh, Measure J is interesting, but I think you should keep a close eyes on it. Anyway, good luck. Thank you for allowing the public to speak. Have a good day. Talk to you later. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roy Humphreys. You may begin. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Roy Hampton. Thank you for all the good things you do. And just a, a couple of comments here uh, that as far as you know, persons use the term uh, uh, data driven, well, as we know from Bernie Madoff, uh, that uh, data can be made to say whatever you want to say. Also, uh, one uh, of the supervisors said something about uh, criminalizing uh, poverty and, uh, and mental illness, which uh, is a root and a cool slap in the face. Uh, to the constituents and that everybody knows that the California Penal Code defines what is a crime. And thank you on that. And uh, to the uh, budget uh, uh, represents the values uh, of the society here. We have a situation where uh, Supervisor Hahn defunded the Fullerton Road widening at the Roland Heights, a critical infrastructure uh, and is an abomination and considering at the same time uh, putting up a million plus dollars for a dog park. Uh, how essential is that? And then in, in, uh, the two years ago over in Whittier, we did a $2 million plus uh, skateboard park. And this project has been on the books for uh, what, eight years? 
so we can go along with that. Also, uh, for uh, Sheriff Bill in the wave, uh, uh, the voters uh, defunded the uh, Sheriff's Department. Also, for the uh, board uh, to require snail mail for uh, the written comments is barbaric and should be a, a computer upload or email at the at the very least. And uh, to uh, uh, comply with the edicts of the uh, courts regarding the transit and homeless situation, the state and counties must develop a comprehensive system of hostel and, as per uh, Europe and uh, campgrounds, starting with uh, the uh, board members, neighborhoods, and community. Also, in, in uh, uh, Rolling Heights, or per the uh, public uh, works of Los Angeles County, notes that the uh, pseudo donation ghetto cans. Of the, uh, Thank county. you. Your time has expired. Okay. Next speaker, please. Our next, our next participant is Tyron Moore. You may begin. Uh, hello, board of supervisors. I'll speak briefly on the both agenda items. Um, I called in to speak in support of the funding of Measure J. For too long, our system has uh, just turned a blind eye and turned its back on the less fortunate and those who have fell fallen into uh, the hands of the justice system. And it's obvious that the research is there, that there needs to be some type of a change because what we have now is not working. So fully funding Measure J, um, looking into the alternatives to incarceration, um, helping those who are how experiencing houselessness and those who really our society has abandoned is a great step towards your care first jail last policy. And also I'd like to speak in support of uh, and thank those who have been working tirelessly in the pandemic, those who are healthcare workers, those who are frontline and those who have continued to support and keep our society and communities moving as we're making our way out. And that I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Melinda Kakani. You may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Great. Hi, this is Melinda Kakani with Children's Defense Fund California. Um, here's the thing. Last I checked, the CEO works for the board and the board works for the people of LA County. And while admittedly, I might not know the intricacies of labor issues, contracting issues, how to run a county that sometimes feels too large for its own good. I do know that the people of LA County have voted based upon, spoken about, taken to the streets because of their disgust, fatigue, and outrage over this obsession with funding law enforcement, perpetuating the status quo, investing in surveillance of communities of color, their incarceration, their punishment, the list goes on and on. $3.3 billion for the sheriff, whose every action has been questioned by this board. $1 billion for the probation department, who was just sued in January by the attorney general's office for the harm they inflicted upon this county's children. Funding youth justice reimagined imagined is directly in line with the care first, jail's last motto this board has repeated. And by funding, I mean finding the full $75 million from probation's budget so that Care First, Jails Last becomes more than just a motto for the children ensnared in the juvenile system. There are approximately 400 youth currently in cages, and we spend $409 million to keep on keeping on with that shameful practice. That's $1 million per year per youth. We have got to do better. And that starts with Youth Justice Reimagined. And the $75 million investment isn't premature. We're not asking for a department tomorrow. We're asking for a shift in power from a system of incarceration, oppression, marginalization to a system of healing, repair, and strength with an investment in that transformation process. So CEO and board, we're asking you to put some county's money, our money, my tax dollars, where your motions are. And that means $75 million for youth justice reimagined. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Cherie Bell. You may begin. 
Hey. Hello, please begin. Hey. Hello, 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 could you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, we all know that Measure J was fought and won off the bloods of black, black lives. The numerous murders of unarmed black people across the world um, is why we have this money to address the systemic uh, racism and alternative to policing. We need you to be courageous and give doing the right thing a chance and keep the promise made to the voters. We need this measure fully funded to address hundreds of years of economic oppression um, and oppression by law enforcement. Um, I'm with the LA Black Worker Center where in LA County, um, black workers in particular are severely unemployed and underemployed. And we believe that this funding for Measure J could go towards addressing this economic oppression by creating quality jobs, um, sustainable housing, and assisting with getting to the root causes of the issues that cause law enforcement to be a part of um, the problem. Um, we've been doing the same old thing for many years, and we need this board of supervisors to give doing the right thing a chance. Um, we need to not look for excuses. We need to stand by the intention of this law and this ballot measure promised by um, promise to the voters um, of LA County, and I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you, next speaker, please. Our next participant is Nicole Brown. You may begin. Good morning. Um, my name is Nicole Brown with the Urban Peace Institute and Los Angeles Youth Uprising Coalition and a constituent of Janice Hahn. Thank you board for this opportunity. I appreciate your words on Youth Justice Reimagine, and I'm asking you to make a financial commitment to these words in June. For youth in LA County, this continues to be a status quo and wasteful budget. Youth Justice Reimagined is about much more than a department. And in the plan, 55 of the $75 million was supposed to get out to community-based organizations so they can provide urgent support to the youth in these times of pandemic distress and an increase in violence. We urgently need that investment to be included in the June budget. I'm here to ask you to number one, fully fund Youth Justice Reimagined with the full $75 million, including $55 million to CBOs to build an ecosystem of youth development. Two, cut all vacant and frozen positions from the juvenile probation budget, including 186 vacant positions in the juvenile institutions while camps and halls sit mostly empty. Three, immediately please stand up the Youth Justice Transition Advisory Group so we can continue to work together to make Youth Justice Reimagined a reality. It has already been seven months since the, since the report was released and we cannot afford to lose more momentum. Four, fully fund Measure J and include a meaningful participatory budgeting process with that. And lastly, on behalf of Urban Peace, and the LA Intervention Coalition, I ask you to fund peacemakers and violence intervention with $250 million from the American Rescue Plan as one of the most urgent and effective investments that you can make. I'd also like to address the probation budget. Last year, despite cuts, probation got more money for juvenile institutions. And in this budget, the CEO found another $9.7 million for, this, for juvenile institutions. They recommended $409 million to incarcerate youth when there are about 400 young people in the campus halls. This would be a million dollars per year. Thank you, your time youth. has expired. Next speaker, please. Thanks. Our next participant is, is Ezekiel Nishiyama. You may begin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, please begin. Hello. Good morning, everybody in attendance here today. My name is Ezekiel Nishiyama. I'm an advocate and community organizer with the anti recidivism Coalition. I'm here today to show support in fully funding youth justice reimagined. As someone who experienced the system, I understand what a young person needs and the right services and programs for, the, for their development. What I don't understand is when probation is messing up and not doing their job, we keep on investing into them and they get more funding. We should be working collectively to move away from the punitive models of incarceration. Do not use DJJ transition as an excuse to fill the 186 vacant positions with the juvenile institutions budget. You should be investing these funds into youth justice reimagined. 
We cannot continue to invest in this very same system that we know has had a long pain and painful history of targeting young people of color. Again, this is not an attack on juvenile prob probation, but a focus on the overall system we are faced with today. When we think about the change that is needed to create a better future for our youth in LA County, we cannot continue to invest in the trauma and harmful experiences that our young people are faced with in, the, in today's current system. We cannot go back and undo the harm that has already been done to those that have been in the carceral setting, but we can create a better future for our youth who are growing up in LA today. Thank you for the time today. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Adita Sherikar. You may begin. Good morning, Aditi Sherikar from Children's Defense Fund, California. I'm calling to urge the board to fully fund Youth Justice Reimagined in the June budget and keep your commitment to care first, jails last. It is imperative that the county give the full 75 million to YJR, including 55 million for community-based organizations that are ready and willing to implement YJR today. Finding the full 75 million should not be hard. A good start would be to cut all vacant and frozen positions from the juvenile probation budget. There are 186 vacant positions that should be cut immediately. The incarcerated and supervised youth population has gone down in the last decade, and yet probation's already bloated budget continues to grow. It's time to invest that money in youth and downsize probation. The county needs to invest the full 75 million in youth justice reimagined and commit to moving towards no more probation staff, no more probation dollars, and no more camps or halls. We cannot delay youth justice reimagined any longer. It is far from premature. It is in fact long, long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. As a reminder to address the board, if you have not done so already, you may press one and then zero, but do not press one and zero a second time or you'll be removed from queue. We will now hear the Spanish interpretation of this reminder. Si aún no lo, como recordatorio, para dirigirse a las supervisoras, si aún no lo ha hecho, presione uno y luego cero en este momento. No presione uno y cero por segunda vez, Thank you. May we have the next speaker, please? Our next participant is Olivia Shields. You may begin. Good morning. My name is Olivia Shields with the Urban Peace Institute and Los Angeles Youth Uprising, commenting on agenda items BH1, BH2, and general public comment. I urge the board to keep your promise of care first and jails last by fully funding youth justice reimagined, which was allocated zero dollars in the recommended LA County CEO budget compared to $3.3 billion for sheriffs and $1 billion for probation. You should have received a letter from over 40 service providers and over 30 youth leaders who are disappointed in the CEO funding decision. We must cut all 186 vacant positions from the juvenile probation budget. Furthermore, we need the, to, we need the full $75 million for youth justice reimagined, including 55 million allocated to community-based organizations which is a comparatively small ask, given that the CEO recommended spending $409 million to incarcerate just 400 young people. We know locking youth up does not make our communities safer, but rather perpetuates structural racism, cycles of poverty, and harm. Only through unequivocally prioritizing the well-being and growth of youth and funding youth justice reimagine will we truly build a safer and more equitable future. Lastly, on behalf of Ur Urban Peace Institute, please fund peacemakers and violence intervention with $250 million from the American Rescue Plan as an urgent and effective investment in care and racial equity. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Nicholas Salazar. You may begin. Hi, this is Nicholas Salazar from the Fund for Guaranteed Income, reading a public comment on behalf of Mayor Asia Brown. My name is Asia Brown, and I serve the great city of Compton, California as mayor. I am compelled to use my voice and position to support alternatives to incarceration initiatives. I urge the LA County Board of Supervisors to provide funding to pre-trial service pilots. Allocating funds and an opportunity such as this to the city of Compton would not only impact the city in the short term, but create long lasting effects that will better the city and county for years to come. Our residents and children are in need of mental and behavioral health services. We have developed a comprehensive roadmap budget an implementation plan for a pre-trial services pilot. This can be ready to launch in July 2021 
in collaboration with the Office of Diversion and Reentry and Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative to create a community care and support agency workforce. The agency workforce will connect residents to return to court and other services via a new web-based public benefits platform. I am excited to share that our plan is supported by the Fund for Guaranteed Income and Compton Community Development Corporation, a new entity which I launched last summer to drive investments into the city through scaled, scalable programming during this critical time. We can move from surviving to thriving when we prioritize community and care. Our county can do this. We can afford it. It is time. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson. You may begin. Good morning, Supervisors. Mark Anthony Clayton Johnson, Frontline Wellness Network, Justice LA, Reimagine LA. We're urging you today to adopt the Care First budget. Uh, this is a budget that advances our Care First solutions and also points out inconsistencies in the current budget. For one, we really want to make sure that if we're going to close Men Central Jail, then we should not be reallocating dollars uh, in anticipation of the jail population increasing. This is the same logic that Health Management Associates provided to you in 2015 when they said that you needed to secure hundreds of millions of dollars to build a mental health jail in anticipation of the jail mental health population doubling. That conventional wisdom has been rejected by us all. And so let's not repeat a mistake that is very recent in time, but distant in paradigm to the very re real care first approach that we're moving. Also, if we're going to invest in care, it is absolutely critical that we do not reproduce harms of policing and incarceration in those care systems. We regularly spend annually $32 million on private security in our DHS hospitals. We should be reallocating the additional $36 million we spend on sheriffs in DHS hospitals because it is inconsistent with our care first approach. Clinicians are regularly telling us that sheriffs in our hospitals violate patient protections, violate Fourth Amendment protections, and abuse patients in the form of unchecked patrol of the hallways, intimidating patients and providers, using protected patient information to press charges on folks, and routinely interrupt and attempt to influence medical decision-making. With devastating results, including the murder of Nicholas Burgos at Harbor UCLA Hospital last, last October. And so we're calling on you to reallocate that additional $36 million into community-based non-law enforcement crisis response in DHS hospitals, violence prevention solutions, and upstream solutions to harm that do not reproduce harm of policing and incarceration in our care facilities. That's how we make good on the care first approach. In addition to that, we fully Thank you. Your time has expired. Next speaker, care. please. Our next participant is Abna Abhinaya Naranyanan. You may begin. My name is Abhinaya Narayanan. I'm a constituent of Catherine Barger, and I'm speaking to both agenda items and general public comment. Today, we've heard a lot about the budget as a value statement and the historic care first vision of the county, but the board needs to take decisive action in order to actually fulfill these promises. Specifically, the proposed budget continues to include $36 million being spent on LA County Sheriff substations at our county hospitals. In the wake of a murder of a patient in mental health crisis, Nicholas Burgos, inside Harbor UCLA at the hands of LASD last October, and the rampant corruption and violence that we know exists within the Sheriff's Department, it's clear that the continued investment in Sheriff's presence in our hospitals is a danger to patients and directly at odds with the care first commitment. The Sheriff has no place in our hospitals. This is abundantly clear when we heard Sheriff Villanueva explicitly stating today that he believes the people our public systems need to care for, unhoused folks, are criminal existential threats to public safety. The community has lost trust that their care facilities are in fact safe. I see this firsthand as a senior medical student training and planning to practice at our county facilities. Our county's most vulnerable and low-income patients, the majority of whom are black and brown, depend on our county health system for care. But with the current contract in place, Sheriffs are given unchecked access to patrol the hallways, intimidate patients and providers, and routinely violate patient privacy and legal rights. Their presence erodes the doctor-patient relationship, creates distrust in the medical system itself, and causes Angelinos to delay or avoid care altogether in fear of criminalization and physical harm. The county already spends $32 million on private security for our hospitals. The continued investment in sheriff presence is in direct opposition to the care first values and an affront to community members who depend on our county hospitals as a space of care and sanctuary. That $36 million needs to be taken out of the sheriff's hands and reinvested into non-law enforcement community safety strategies that actually center the healing and well-being of our community. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Kent Mendoza. You may begin. Hello, good morning. My name is Ken Mendoza. I'm with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and the LA Uprising Coalition. I'm just here to reiterate what almost everybody has been commenting in regarding the budget. I want to urge the board to fully fund Youth Justice Reimagined in the June budget and keep your commitment to care first and just last. We need the full 75 million for Youth Justice Reimagined, including the 55 million for community-based organizations as outlined in the Youth Justice Reimagined report. Uh, the board has unanimously passed the motion to kickstart the Youth Justice Reimagined this year, uh, and we are asking you to continue to keep that commitment. We should reduce probation's budget, particularly for the juvenile probation, in order to fund the Youth Justice Reimagined. We must cut all vacant and frozen positions from juvenile probation budget. The Juvenile Justice Institution Unit has 186 vacant positions, like everybody has mentioned in the past. They should be cut as the camps and halls have record low numbers of youth inside. The population of youth who are incarcerated and supervision has plumbed, plummet in the last decade, yet probation budget has only grown. We need to invest in youth downsizing and downsizing the probation budget. The CEO recommends 409 million to incarcerate 400 young people. That means that we should be spending over 1 million per year per youth, which makes no sense. Um, and when probation messes up, we just continue to uh, find more money to give them. And like people have mentioned in the past, um, these departments of, of incarceration have already been, um, you know, under investigation by the Department of Justice and other things like that. And, you know, for some reason, we still uh, keep incentivizing them with some type of money. Uh, so I just really want to urge the board to, to really live up to the care first, last jail um, deem or whatever you want to call it or slogan, but really actually, you know, live up to those things and really fund this uh, Youth Justice Reimagined. We are one of the richest counties in the entire state. We have Thank all you. The Your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Counties. Our next speaker is Hector Ramirez. You may begin. Uh, buenos dias. Hello, everybody. My name is Hector Ramirez. Uh, my family and I live in the ancestral lands of the Bernardino Totavia and Bernard Mission Indians here in the Fifth District. I have a psychiatric disability and I'm a consumer of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. Uh, when I, where I'm one of the co-chairs for Latina USCC now for the past few years. Uh, the Latina USCC um, is composed of the largest, uh, and represents the largest majority of the residents of LA County, which are our Latinx, uh, Hispanic, Chicago, Chicano population. And we also represent the largest number of people that receive services from the Department of Mental Health, 17% um, of which uh, identify as being Spanish monolingual. Um, I really uh, wanted to thank the CEO for, for the report and really look forward to further engagement conversations around the budget, particularly around issues of Metro J. My comments are to item two, um, as we look at DMH uh, budget um, for the coming years. Um, I, I really want to thank uh, the, the Board of Supervisors for listening to the concerns of our community. Uh, for the past few years, we've been providing the Department of Mental Health with very important information, uh, particularly uh, during this COVID pandemic. Um, and for the first time, the department is submitting an MHSA uh, budget that actually includes the comments and recommendations of the stakeholders, um, despite the fact that the MHSA passed many years ago. But that didn't happen by accident. It came by significant advocacy and, and, and information from our Latino DMH consumers. Um, and it came back at a, at a price. We did experience retribution, uh, harassment and even stigmatizing, uh, you know, situations from the department and even from some of our mental health commissioners uh, who push back, um, you know, against DMH consumers. And I hope that as the county continues to develop this budget processes, that they are more safe uh, and really trauma-informed so that our consumers and our communities who take the time during the pandemic to provide the county with vital information, even Thank as we're, your even time as has we're expired. dealing with our Next own speaker, please. Our next participant is Tony Wilson. You may begin. Hi, my name is Tony Wilson. I have been a security officer for 17 years. I am an armed officer for, at the county Los Angeles Probation Department. Um, it's hard working, it's hard doing the work. I like the work, but I believe that, I, that, I believe that we're, my job is important in keeping people safe. The pandemic has especially been hard for the officers, me and my coworkers. 
We are essential, and no one's recognizing that. We have to go to work also. I know my I know a few coworkers that have caught COVID-19. Like myself, a lot of us do not have health care. I have to pay out of pocket to go to the doctor. I need glasses right now, but I have to buy them from Walgreens because I can't afford it. We are essential workers, and we are on the front line also. I want to do better. I want you guys to do better. But in order for that, L.A. County has to pass a budget that allows the ability for us to have health care. I am fighting with the union. I'm fighting to join the union because I want improvement in our work conditions. Health care is one of those improvements, and we cannot improve health care without the support of the board. As you're going through your budget process, please remember all the central workers, including security, like myself, who go to work every day with no health care. You can change this by passing a budget that gives us health care. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ronaldo V. Yeva. You may begin. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hello, my name is Ronaldo Villeva. I am a constituent of Holly Mitchell, an advocacy and community organizer for the Anti Disabled Coalition, and a youth leader for the Mount San Juan Uprising Coalition. I'm here to speak up for youth justice to imagine and uplift the decades of work which has been done by my colleagues and peers of life. As a formerly incarcerated youth who has been through the system, and as an advocate for my peers to inspire, we need to fund communities, fund community based organizations, fund leadership programs, and break the status quo, which continues to fund law enforcement agencies who do not benefit our communities. The Board of Supervisors needs to take notice of the community efforts which have fought hard and continue to fight for hope probation accountable. Youth justice reimagined is a solution, it is not overdue. The CEO does not have the right to dismiss the community work of hundreds of people who benefited in time to yield the support. The time to fund youth justice reimagined is down. The time for meaningful leadership is now. Show the community that you care and put your money in your markets. Thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Roxana Aguilar. Your line is open. Yes, hello. My name is Roxana Aguilar. I'm with the LA Conservation Corps and the Reimagine LA Coalition. Um, today, I urge the County Board of Supervisors to adopt the Reimagine LA County Care First budget that elevates the Care First demands of closing Men's Central Jail, fully funding Measure J, um, and increasing the allocation of um, to a higher amount than what it currently is. Um, funding the first care budget by allocating at least $2.17 um, uh, billion in year one through leveraging dollars from Measure J and other local, state, and federal resources. Funding youth justice reimagined by shifting $75 million out of probation as part of the first care budget and committing to building the care first vision through authentic community collaboration, power sharing, and participatory budgeting to ensure consistent, equitable investment. Um, I urge you to also um, take notice of all of the young people that have been deeply impacted by COVID, by unemployment at historic rates, and invest in our future. Um, young people really need more investment from the county um, to find employment and to live full, meaningful lives. Thank you. Thank you. Next sticker, please. Our next participant is Cindy Halsaro. You may begin. Please begin. May we have the next speaker, please? Our this next speaker is Amelia Hello, you. Sapien. Mrs. Salaro, you, you may yes. begin. Hello, this is, hi, thank you to the Board of Supervisors for today. My name is Cindy Alfaro. I'm a security officer at DPSS in West LA. I am here today to express the board how urgent it is to make sure the budget shows essential workers like myself have health insurance. I have been working to keep LA County safe with or without a pandemic. Um, I go out every day to give the best to the people of Los Angeles, even if it means exposing myself to this pandemic. I know my job is important. Even before we were called essential workers, now the pandemic has shown the value of the work we do. We are making sure people and buildings are safe every day, yet many of us don't have the safety net to, of having health insurance. 
we could get sick and no one would have our back. Any county of supervisors, you can change that. You can have our back. The budget you are working or on can change the lives of people like myself. But it's bigger than that. I, it could change the lives of thousands of essential workers in the county. We can come out of this pandemic not just surviving, but thriving. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And that next speaker is Emilio Zapian. Your line is open. Hi, good morning, board. Uh, my name is Emilio with the Youth Justice Coalition and LA Youth Uprising Coalition. Um, and I'm urging our county leaders to fully fund Youth Justice Reimagine with 75 million and adopting a Care First budget, including fully funding Measure J um, and stepping up to ensure that our communities, community victories become a reality. For over 15 years, system impacted young people have been organizing marching, rallying, surveying, and testifying at these Board of Supervisors hearings, urging county leaders to prioritize a robust youth development department, and you all answered the call by taking the first step in November. Young people have the solutions to their own issues and communities, and young people are the leaders of now. We cannot wait any longer for Youth Justice Reimagined. The Sheriff's budget is currently over $3.3 billion. The probation budget is currently over $1 billion, including 409 mil to incarcerate 400 young people in juvenile probation. Imagine what we could do with a million dollars for system impacted young people each. And for youth development, CEO's recommended budget is currently $0. We must cut all vacant and frozen positions from the juvenile probation budget that's 186 positions that could be full-time youth jobs, youth center employees, and intervention workers. We can't wait another year. We can't wait another month. We can't wait another day to begin making this happen. Please support community victories this June. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Unisys Hernandez. You may begin. Hi, good morning. Honorable board members, my name is Eunice Hernandez. I'm the co-executive director and co-founder of La Defensa and a member of the Reimagine LA County Co uh, Coalition. Today, I urge you to adopt the Care First budget proposal developed and sent to you all by the Reimagine uh, LA County Coalition. And just to take a step back, we've been talking about the budget, we've been talking about Measure J, and a lot of the combo is focused around job loss. And so really, if we are to build out a system of alternatives to incarceration and, and a decentralized system of care, we will need the supervisors and the CEO for you all to reframe your thinking around job loss. Everybody, and I mean everybody, wants jobs with benefits and wages where we can thrive, and we can accomplish, accomplish this through the just transition model. The just transition model creates pathways to shift jobs out of the departments that make up the systems of criminalization and incarceration and into jobs that will help build out a decentralized system of care and housing. You will see this as a funding recommendation and strategy uh, that will be presented to you through the Measure J process. Supervisor Han, thank you for requesting more money for the down payment in Measure J year one. In our last Measure J meeting, the draft list of year one Measure J request was at least $185 million. Youth reimagined. So much work has gone into that process. It does feel a little bit inequitable when we look back at how fast the ATI initiative was created, how fast some resources were, resources were invested, and it feels like we're leaving youth behind at one of the most critical moments where we've seen them get the short end of the stick through this whole pandemic, not having the power and uh, you know discretion to choose where they are in McDonald's parking lots trying to get Wi-Fi. Like we cannot let them down, and this budget fails to meet the moment for them. La Defensa stands in full solidarity with ACIU 721s and the demands of the healthcare workers and other frontline workers that have sacrificed themselves and their families in order for us to survive in this pandemic. I really want to thank the CEO and the board for opening up this process for us to speak, but we need more transparency in the budget process. We need, and just, if you look at the care first budget that we proposed. Thank you, your time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Joseph Malish. You may begin. Um, okay. Uh, hello, supervisors. Um, I uh, second what uh, Anita just said about shifting jobs. And I think that there is much that can be done in shifting the budget and shifting the jobs and the county workers with it, no matter what their jobs are now, that can be transferred to something better um, and retraining. However, I also want to talk about the supply of money side of things and the revenues. 
Uh, some of you remember you were there. The board made a brief attempt in 2016 to feel out state government about permitting the county to institute a tax on high income with the goal of using the proceeds for homeless services in that case. It polled 76 positive among likely county voters. Um, and when the reading of state politics came back as negative, the board abandoned the plan, but it could have put it on the ballot anyway this, with the provision that it was going to affect only if the state gives permission to the county. And that might inspire others, get other counties to go along with it, uh, maybe get some timid state politicians to uh, take some steps to. I don't know if that's one kind of plan, but let's look at the revenue side also, because we're talking about adding services. We're talking about undoing some of the 40 years of anti-public sector spending, anti-public sector services. The dearth of the services has caused additional misery in society. You can't do anything about widespread poverty without also facing up to doing something about concentrated wealth. Uh, so a mix of refiguring the budget, shifting the people, and uh, seeking more revenues, there's just no excuse not to do it. Supervisor Antonovich said wealthy people would move out of the county. I say goodbye. We know how to share here. We're going to have a county that's more inspiring. Thank you. Your everyone. time has expired. Stay. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Gabriela Vasquez. You may begin. Good morning, board. My name is Gabriela Vasquez. I'm an organizer with La Defensa, the Justice LA Coalition, and the Reimagine LA Coalition, and a resident of the first district. For community members, equity has never been a buzzword. Community is the reason why the board stopped the 3.1 billion jailed expansion, and community is the reason why Measure J passed in November. I urge the County Board of Supervisors to adopt the county's recommendations under the Reimagine LA County Care First budget by following these Care First demands. To close Men's Central Jail by reducing the jail population by at least 5,000 people and capturing cost savings for community-based care. To fully fund Measure J by allocating at least $900 million in the three years. To fund the Care First budget by allocating at least $2 billion, <coughs> excuse me, $2 billion in year one through leveraging dollars from Measure J and other local, state, and federal resources. To fund Youth Justice Reimagined by shifting $75 million out of the probation and part of the, uh, part of the Care First budget. To commit to building the Care First vision through authentic community collaboration, through power shifting, and through participatory budgeting to ensure consistent, equitable investments, and to fund heroes pay for all, and instituting a cost of living increase for county workers this fiscal year. If the budget reflects the county's values, then we currently value funding law enforcement far more than we do community based needs. The board must no longer set aside funding that protects the abuse and the harm that our community members have experienced at the hands of law enforcement. The county currently spends roughly $630 per resident on law enforcement uh, offices, including the sheriff's office, probation department, and the court. For the sheriff's uh, budget alone, this year's spending plan amounts to 337 per resident. Currently around 91% of the sheriff's and DA's budget, along with 80% of the probation department budget is spent on personnel like Villanueva, who's threatening everybody every single day. By contrast, LA County spends roughly $10 per resident on affordable housing. Realizing the mandate by voters requires full funding of Measure J, full impl implementation. Thank you. Your time has expired. Generated. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Ronald Collins. You may begin. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Awesome. Um, hello, my name is Ron Collins. I'm an organizer with the Los Angeles Black Workers Center and a coordinator with the Reimagine LA County Coalition. I'm here to firstly uplift the demands that many folks have already talked about, which is one, adopting the Care First budget. That means fully funding Measure J, that means closing MCJ, that means really thinking about the way we spend our money and pushing it into the community to the folks who need it the most. The Care First budget was developed um, by the Imagine LA Coalition to be reflective of a Care First approach, to be reflective of the things that our communities need every single day. We also need to make sure that we are instituting a cost of living increase for our county workers. We, throughout the pandemic, they have been the folks who've carried um, the entire county, right? These are the folks who have been trying to 
who've been trying to keep us safe throughout this entire pandemic. And the least that the county can do is to make sure that those folks have the economic resources that they need in order to take care of their families. I would remind us that we live in the wealthiest city, in the wealthiest county, in the wealthiest state, in the wealthiest nation in the world. There is enough money to make sure that our people are taken care of. I would also just like to um, kind of respond. I'm going to take off my professional hat and, and really respond um, to something as a member of the community. We heard earlier Sheriff Villanueva um, situate unhoused folks as uh, existential threats to our community. The reality is, is that a, more than a third of unhoused folks are black. Right? Um, we understand that black folks also disproportionately suffer at the hands of police. So when we have the head of the South Angeles County Sheriff's Department situating unhoused folks as existential threats to the community, in my mind that is situating black folks as existential threats to the community. And I think that that needs to be interrogated by one, making sure that we have less money within the sheriff's budget and more money into the programs that we know that are gonna keep us out of the line of sight of law enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Yvette Ali or Ale. You may begin. Thank you, Supervisor Yvette Ale with Dignity and Power Now, Justice LA, and Reimagine LA Coalition. You know, nearly a year ago, the board deliberated on a $3.43 billion sheriff budget and a $1 billion probation budget. Supervisor Hahn courageously abstained from approving that budget and rightly called it a status quo budget. Today, you're deliberating on a $3.412 sheriff billion dollar budget and over $1 billion for probation once again. Despite the sheriff's whining and threats, this is yet again a status quo budget. This budget does not reflect our values. It does not reflect the board's care for vision. And the proposed down payment for Measure J doesn't begin to fund the recommendations developed through the painstaking community process, nor does it begin to chip away at the generations of divestment from black, brown, and indigenous communities. We appreciate the support of Supervisor Solis, Kuehl, and Hahn in placing Measure J on the ballot and Supervisor Mitchell's support during the campaign. But the fact of the matter is that we never needed Measure J to transform the budget. We shouldn't need Measure J to deliver our, our communities the services they deserve and desperately need. All we've ever needed is the political will from this body to shift funding out of law enforcement and into community-based public safety, housing, mental health services, and jobs. When we demand fully funding Measure J and adopting the Care First budget, what we are asking is for you to make good on the policies you've supported and the rhetoric we hear from the board week after week. We see you as partners in justice, and please don't let us down. I also want to elevate and reiterate Onisa Hernandez's comments. Measure J is not antithetical to jobs and shouldn't be. That is not why we voted for Measure J. What we need is a fundamental shifting of those jobs into community-based services, into supporting our, our nurses and frontline workers. They deserve to be supported, and Measure J allows an avenue for that. But so long as we maintain these bloated law enforcement budgets, our frontline workers, our health service providers, will not be receiving the type of, of wage increases and support that they need on the front lines. Our children will not be receiving the types of support they need to keep them out of Thank the Thank you. Your time has expired. So next speaker, please. Our next participant is Sophia Lee. You may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Okay. Hi, my name is Sophia Lee. I'm a member of the Reimagine LA Coalition and a resident in the first district. I absolutely agree with all the supervisors who said earlier that our values are in our budget. Where I have concerns is that if we truly purport to have a care first mentality in, in LA County, that that's absolutely not reflected in our budget. I wanna reiterate the numbers that Yvette just said, $3.41 billion for the Sheriff's Department and more than a billion dollars for probation. And yet Sheriff Villanueva wants to cry about his department not having enough money. To Sheriff Villanueva, shame on you. Unhoused folks are not a threat to public safety. And if anything, the LA Sheriff's Department has a much, poses a much larger threat to public safety. I wanna echo the calls to fund youth justice reimagined by shifting $75 million out of probation as part of the Care First. Oh, and I also wanna echo calls, excuse me, to fund the Care First budget and to fully fund Measure J. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn, for pushing for more Measure J dollars. And I want to just reiterate, Right now, probation has more than $1 billion, and over the past two years, their budget has grown $71.6 million. Still, however, the probation department has ignored the Board of Supervisors' directive to find long-term funding for programs that actually do provide alternatives to incarceration, one being breaking barriers. 
which provides uh, housing case management and employment training for individuals on felony probation in LA County. Breaking Barriers provides a clear example for a care first program that helps people reintegrate into the community, get housing, get jobs, get the care that they need. And despite the over $1 billion in probation's budget, they fail to find a minuscule $2.25 million to sustain the Breaking Barriers program for the next fiscal year. Why does the CEO's office continue Thank you. to Your time has expired. Department? Next speaker, please. Our next participant is Gina Viola. You may begin. Thank you. My name is Gina Viola. I'm a member of White People for Black Lives. $100 million for Measure J is an absolute slap in the face to the entire Los Angeles County. Measure J's history started with Measure R. Measure R was the first step toward the Care First budget and demanded that we look at better ways to spend a previously allotted $3.5 billion to build new jail. The voters in March of 2020 said no more. The voters understood what seems to be commonplace understanding now. Using incarceration as a means for all of our social ills is not working. The county passed Measure R with 73% of the vote, which was historic and created the alternative to incarceration. The ATI initiative has been robust and grown on the backs of organizers, giving of their time to realize it into something tangible and applicable. As far as Measure R is concerned, the ATI initiative should have a starting balance of $3.5 billion. Then along comes Measure J, meant to put dollars and cents to the ATI findings. And now it is no wonder why the board was keen to fast track Measure J. We understand it is being used as a means to reduce the dollars that will be spent on the ATI initiative. This is simply unacceptable and frankly illegal. The voters have told you twice, two elections in a row in fact, that we want money spent on alternatives to incarceration and we want that happening now. You've increased the sheriff's budget year after year to the detriment of the rest of the county. It has not kept us safer. It has not found us in a healthier place. It has not found our youth better educated. In fact, quite the opposite. This sheriff's department has killed 18 people since the people's uprising after the death of George Floyd. The correlation that should be made is that more money to law enforcement leaves little to invest into healthy communities. This is language being used in many circles now in the cries to defund the police and the like. It is time for you as a board to fully fund the Care First Jails Last Plan you have been putting together along with many members of the community this past year. I can see now that the erasure of the Measure R language on the ATI portion Thank you. Your of the time has expired. Next speaker, please. Our next participant is James Griswold. You may begin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please begin. Hi, my name is James, and I'd like to comment on both agenda items and public comment. Um, I live in Mar Vista, so thank you to Supervisor Mitchell for your support today. Um, I'd just like to add my voice to the demands of the Reimagine LA Coalition called to fully fund Measure J with at least $900 million, especially over law enforcement and by closing Men's Central Jail. Um, while I can see the county and the CEO's office have spent a lot of time improving its Care First Jail's last support, I think allocating $100 million for Measure J really betrays communities' trust. People voted based on all the press coverage last November, estimating almost a billion dollars. Uh, and this morning, CEO Davenport pointed out that many accounting terms in Measure J are listed in various county glossaries and documents. In order for someone in the community to have their voice heard and provide input on this budget, it seems like they need a full-time job as a tax analyst. Um, I've been attending Measure J meetings since last year before Measure J was passed, and community members have had to attend countless meetings during the workday, flog through deeply buried web pages, read hundreds of pages of reports, all in volunteer hours. All of these meetings and reports seem to pop up suddenly when they're difficult to keep up to date on. And that's just not transparency. You know, I don't know how we can claim transparency with that kind of process. And so as many others have said, we have the technology and funding to do better than this if we want it, if we prioritize it. At the end of the day, this obfuscation deprioritizes community voice. And so I don't accept the justification for $100 million funding that the community doesn't have the accounting expertise to understand the language of what they voted for. They, I think the community knows what we voted for. Thank you, your time has declared. expired. Next speaker, please. Madam Chair, there are no other speakers in the queue to address the board. 
Thank you. Uh, our time for public comments has ended. I want to thank all that called in to speak this morning and we'll continue to accept written comments that have come in during the meeting, which will become part of the record. Therefore, members, I'd like to uh, issue the following. I move that the board receive and file and take under advisement various supplemental budget requests and comments made during the public budget hearings commencing today, May 19, 2021. And make a finding that a notice of public budget hearings was given in accordance to section 29080 of the government code that said hearings commenced on May 19, 2021 pursuant to said notice and is required by section 29081 of the government code. I also move that the board close the public budget hearings for purposes of oral testimony, finding that there are no persons who have not been given the opportunity to be heard, but to allow maximum public input permit addition, additional written testimony and request to be filed through the close of business Friday, May 28, 2021. I further move that the board reaffirms that budget deliberations will begin on Monday, June 28, 2021 at 9.30 a.m. I so move to approve, seconded by Supervisor Kuehl. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Supervisor Mitchell. Aye. Supervisor Mitchell, aye. Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Kuehl. Supervisor Juan. Aye. I'm sorry, this is Supervisor Kuehl. I kept pressing the buttons and nothing was happening. Uh, I vote aye. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. That concludes today's meeting. Please note that the Board of Supervisors will hold a special closed session meeting on Tuesday, May 25th, 2020. One on and on Tuesday, June the 1st, 2021. The next regular meeting of the board will be held on Tuesday, June the 8th, 2021. Thank you to all and to the public for your comments. Thank you, members.